Well, and good morning. My name is Jonathan Butcher, and I'm the Education Director at the Goldwater Institute, which is a research and legal organization in Arizona where we fight for liberty. We like to say we are the place where freedom wins. Now, I went to college in South Carolina. I am a Furman grad, so go Paladins. And in recent years, as I've lived in Arizona and tried to very hard to adapt to the arid desert, and I have hunted scorpions, I have stepped on a cactus, I really have, and I have gotten myself lost in the desert. So I like to tell people that working very hard to become a real Arizona resident, or as my South Carolina wife likes to call us, captives. (laughs) So how high would a pile of $1 million make in $1,000 bills if you stacked them up? Seven inches. Now, how high would a pile of $1 billion make in $1,000 bills? 28 feet higher than the Washington Monument. That means that recent White House budget requests of $70 billion for education would be enough bills to stack 70 Washington monuments on top of each other. If we consider the total amount of money across states and the federal government spent on education, we're somewhere in the neighborhood of $600 billion. That's 600 monuments to education funding stacked on top of each other. Now, stay with me here for a minute. If the Washington Monument is 555 feet tall, that means our education spending every year stretches 63 miles straight up. So what do we have to show for it? Obviously, the conversation about student achievement and test scores has gone on for years and years about how underwhelming and underperforming schools across the country are. In fact, school uh, scores, and this is critical because in in recent weeks, the most uh, updated results from the nation's report card, which looks at math and reading scores for fourth graders and eighth graders, showed slight upticks in certain states around the U.S. There are certain places where we can look and see that there have been incremental steps up in student scores among fourth graders and eighth graders. But here's the thing. Among 17-year-olds in the longitudinal version of this nation's report card, those scores are unchanged from 1973. So that means that we can talk all we want about how things might be incrementally better for fourth graders and eighth graders, but the kids that are graduating are not doing any better than they were some 30-plus years ago. And just recently... Just last year in Arizona, we once again had the debate with teachers unions and members of the education establishment over whether or not we should raise taxes once again to pay for spending, to pay for education. When we know that federal spending on education has gone up 138% between the years, excuse me, between the years of 1987 and 2007. And during that same time period, states across the U.S. more than doubled their education spending after adjusting for inflation. So for the past three years, while I have been at the Goldwater Institute, our approach to dealing with this issue of student achievement and parent choice and solving this very difficult problem of giving every child the chance at a great education has been education savings accounts. Arizona has the only education savings account program in the country, and with the accounts, public money is deposited in private bank accounts that parents can use for different educational services. Parents can use the money for private school tuition, tutoring services, or online classes. So think of an HSA, a health savings account, except in the world of education. Today, over 230,000 Arizona children are eligible, thanks to work that the Goldwater Institute has done. And this includes children with special needs, students in our failing public schools, adopted children, and children in military families. And so that's about one out of five public school children in the state of Arizona that is eligible. 
This fall, the Department of Education reports that 761 children are taking part, are participating in the education savings accounts. And each of these students comes at a cost savings to the taxpayer because only 90% of the per student amount from the funding formula is deposited in each account. Now I have a video of a mom using the account that I wanted to show you. So what Holland Hines just described for you is a life that has been changed, and it didn't take a tax increase and didn't take more funding. Participating families have even created a message board on yahoo.com of their, no one told them to do it, they did it all on their own, and they trade ideas and they talk about schools and curriculum and ways to use the cards, free days at the zoo, all sorts of different options, you name it. And these parents are living proof that if people are free to make choices for themselves, they will, and they will do so carefully. Since November 2011, the message board has grown to over 206 families, and they've posted some 4,000 messages. And just this year, the first research on these accounts was released by the Goldwater Institute along with the Friedman Foundation, and it looked at how parents are spending their money. And the question is, When you give parents these accounts, are they just going to pick a school or are they actually going to find different services that meet the unique needs of their children? Turns out they are choosing from different services. They are picking different things like online classes and tutors and in the case of students with special needs, different uh, educational therapists. So we have created something that makes parents entrepreneurs for their children's future. Now, unfortunately for students in the program, unions in the state school board association have challenged it in court, and my colleague Clint Bullock is defending these students. In October, the Arizona Court of Appeals upheld an earlier ruling by the Superior Court, which upheld the program. And so now the union is taking the uh, education savings account families to the Arizona Supreme Court to to battle, battle it out there. Now, what makes 
The savings account so pivotal, as Holland outlined in her comments, is that this is the first education reform that allows parents to customize their child's education. Now, school vouchers and tax credit scholarships have been around in many states for years. And as you know, in South Carolina, you now have a tax credit scholarship program. But with the number of online options and charter schools and private schools and the wide variety of ways that we can help students succeed, the accounts for the first time allow parents to decide not just where their child learns, but how. And this is an important new perspective for education in the United States. A woman named Quinn Cummings wrote a book called The Year of Learning Dangerously, Adventures in Homeschooling, last year. And she says, and I'm going to quote from her, she says, imagine that your high school junior spends half of every day at the brick-and-mortar school up the street. Two afternoons a week, he logs into an art history seminar being taught by a grad student in Paris. He takes computer animation classes at the local college, sings in the church choir, and dives at the community pool. He studies web design on YouTube. He and three classmates see a tutor at the public library who preps them for AP chemistry. He practices Spanish on Skype and takes cooking lessons at a nearby restaurant every Saturday morning. Now, Cummings didn't know about Arizona's education savings accounts, but that's her vision, right? As a parent, that's what she had as a vision for her children. And in Arizona, we've taken steps now to make that a reality. So just quickly as I finish, this vision for education, a vision that makes parents entrepreneurs for their child's future, is in stark contrast to the future being meticulously planned for students through what appears to be a favorite punching bag in a lot of states these days, and that is the Common Core State Standards. Instead of giving parents more options with the standards, the Common Core makes it more difficult to meet the unique needs of every child because the concept behind the standards, and don't miss this, is sameness. We're talking about the same material, the same test, which can only lead to similar instruction. And that argument over how best to craft sameness has taken the place of achievement. We are told that schools will still have autonomy over teaching. We are told that local control will still be preserved. Obviously, only time will tell whether or not this is true. But early indications are that we should look long and hard about what we're being told about the Common Core. Honestly, we don't know if the standards will actually improve student achievement in the United States. We don't. There are no gold standard studies, random assignment studies, on these standards in particular that demonstrate that these standards lead to, to higher levels of achievement. Don't get me wrong, our students need high standards, right? Students should be challenged. And I don't think the standards that most states had before the Common Core, frankly, were rigor enough, rigorous enough. And this is demonstrated because when you look at the score results among state tests, and you compare those results to what the national uh, report card, the nation's report card shows, there is a gap, right? Some states, such as Arizona, where there are some 60, 62 percent of our schools that earned an A or a B on the state report card, yet we're in the bottom 10 states when it comes to reading and math on the nation's report card. So there's obviously a gap, right? Something's not lining up. But the solution is not sameness. As Eric Hanushek whose work on education finance and teacher quality has helped shape the debate on those topics, he said a couple of weeks ago, quote, the fundamental problem is a lack of minimal skills and not that everyone should be taught the same skills. As history clearly indicates, simply calling for students to know more or the same material is not the same as ensuring that they will learn more. So let's not miss the point. We will not move the needle on student achievement without something different happening between parents and their children or teachers and the students in their classroom. And it's the degree to which any government should get involved with the classroom that remains the principal debate over the standards. The Common Core doesn't change the question of how limited government should be in education. And this has effectively taken the focus off of student achievement and success in the debate over what is best for our students. Standards-based reform on its own has distracted us from the critical task of helping parents find quality choices for their children. 
The debate over the standards has been a guessing game about what exactly the Common Core is going to do. Federal oversight clouds the argument, as do competing claims about whether teachers will be free to run their classrooms or to meet, their, meet the needs of their students. Last example for you. Just the other day I was reading in Education Week an article about Montgomery County, Maryland, and the Common Core. Montgomery County is one of the, one of the wealthiest and uh, higher performing districts in the country. And the superintendent of that district said, uh, and I quote, Montgomery County Public Schools started working on aligning curriculum, note that, to the Common Core four years ago. So he had the intention of changing what's taught in the classroom. Even with all the in infrastructure and support in Montgomery County Public Schools, it will still take more than two years to fully implement our new accountability system and even longer before all elements of it are effectively used in every school. So do the math. That's six years, enough time for a child to go from sixth grade to twelfth grade before the system is just perfect enough so that those who are advocating for the Common Core can actually expect to see the significant improvement in the schools and the students that they want. Now, quick solution for you. What if we allowed schools to opt out if they could document that they had higher standards? Which is certainly possible considering what states like California and Massachusetts had before the Common Core. In fact, I saw one of the leading advocates for the standards just the other day in a debate, and he actually mentioned the idea that the Common Core might not be designed for every student, every public school student. In fact, what if charter school students, in particular, were allowed to be exempt? Those schools, as we know, are public schools, but they are given the freedom to choose their own curriculum, and they are given the freedom to choose their own teaching standards. And so if, as is suggested by the comments from Montgomery County, if the idea is to align curriculum with the standards, for those schools that should have the freedom over what to teach and how to teach, we should at least consider what it would mean for those schools to have freedom. Remember, the goal that we should all be striving for is not uniformity, but achievement. And a wide variety of teaching styles, curriculum choices, and mission statements are the very things that make charter schools and private schools. It's what they bring to students. That's, that's their advantage, right? We should, take, we should make every effort to preserve that while still measuring performance. Finally, let me paraphrase something that George Will wrote some years ago on good government. And he says that our task should be to determine what government can successfully do and not do, as well as what it should do and should not do. And that is our responsibility. It's our responsibility with whether it's school choice and education savings accounts, or whether it's something like the Common Core Standards. Thank you.